All right, welcome to our second Alia Graphic webinar. I'm Georgi Rutia from Kingston Libraries in Victoria, and I'm also the convener for this wonderful group of volunteers who love comics and libraries. As a national group based across the land we call Australia, we would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of this land and acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. This was and always will be Aboriginal land. I would specifically like to acknowledge the Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation as the custodians of the land from where I'm speaking myself. And I pay respect to the elders past and present of all First Nations people across the land. Now, before we get started, a couple of housekeeping things. We are recording this event and we will be making it available as an audio podcast and it will also appear on our YouTube Hello. channel. Just give us a few days to get it sorted. Please keep your mic muted to avoid unwanted noise and disruption. And we also hope to have time at the end for questions. So if you have any questions, please put them on the chat and we'll try to answer them at the end. Yeah. With all that out of the way, um, welcome to our webinar. And today we're going to hear from four amazing guests that I'm really, really excited to have here with us. We're starting with Gabby and she has been an Alia Graphic team member since its inception, pretty much. And she's situated in Western Sydney where she currently works as a branch librarian. Previously, she worked in a school library where she first developed a love of children's and YA literature. And early this year, she completed her master's of information studies specializing in children's literature. She can always be found with a book close by with the majority of them being new release YA novels and middle, graphic, uh, middle grade graphic novels. And um, she loves helping children and teenagers find the book uh, that they fall in love with. And that's what she wants to do for the rest of her life. So, which is, I think, awesome. So. Uh, we're going to hear from Gabby, so the floor is yours. Okay. <laughs> um, hello uh, from wherever you are joining from. Um, yes, my name is Gabby. Um, I'm from New South Wales. I worked in a school library for um, seven years and have uh, been working as a branch librarian for the last two. Um, I love middle grade graphic novels. <laughs> um, and today, let me just do that. Um, yes, so the uh, focus of uh, my chat today will be on like collection development um, and growing uh, your junior and middle grade uh, collections um, with comics and graphic novels. So I think one of the really like main questions um, I get asked uh, when I'm in the library uh, by parents, um, it happened all throughout when I uh, worked at a school um, <laughs> and it happens now, uh, was why comics um, and like what benefit do they have? Why should my child be reading them? Um, and they're always really oop, uh, surprised um, when I sort of give them the facts. <laughs> Um, so yes, there's the high incidence of median words, uh, the rare words per 1000 is 53.5%, uh, which is higher than adult fiction. Um, and it really uses, have such concise and rich language. Um, so for a struggling or developing reader, um, exposing them to graphic novels really allows them to decode and, um, Oh, I've lost the word. <laughs> um, anyway, to decode uh, both the story with using the pictures and the words um, and exposes them to um, rich language. Um, whilst for uh, advanced readers, um, it really helps them sort of understand that you can write um, a, a story using minimal words but have impact. Um, so yeah, that's, that's sort of the why, <laughs> um, and now we'll move into the fun stuff. Um, so the first, we'll start off with, um, younger readers, uh, which I feel like in the last 
for three years. Um, the production <laughs> of comics for younger readers has just sort of uh, exploded. Um, I see them a lot more often. Um, so yeah, so here is a selection that I would always, um, I had in my school library. We have some of them here in our library and we're getting more of them. Um, so generally they have animal characters. Um, they deal with themes like friendship, um, some differences and they're funny. Um, they're all a series, which is great uh, for those kids who, you know, find something that, that they love and they will just keep reading the whole series. Um, Narwhal, Unicorn of the Sea, the newest one, um, she becomes a unicorn. <laughs> um, so that's quite that's quite a fun one that I really enjoy. Um, peanut butter, peanut butter and crackers. Um, that's a really cute uh, story as well. Um, you know, two dogs and a cat. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> And then here are some more. Um, so Surviving the Wild series, that is by Remy Lai, um, who is an Australian creator. Um, these three uh, all deal with environmental issues. Um, and at the back, they have uh, facts on how kids um, can help protect the environment. Um, I've read uh, these three and boy, oh boy, are they emotional as well. <laughs> Um, if you have if you have read them um, yeah Rainbow the Koala uh, deals with um, fires um, Sunny the Shark is uh, pollution of the ocean and uh, Star the Elephant is um, about uh, um, elephant conservation um, so yeah so they're very fun and they're very cute but they are they really take you on a wild ride <laughs> Um, so that's a great, uh, series to get in your library. Um, yeah, uh, I really dig pizza, the hungry heroes, they're very cute. <laughs> and then, uh, Fitz and Cleo is one that I, I love. Um, and I especially like this little, this little panel, <laughs> I think it sort of sums up us as, uh, book lovers. <laughs> I think I've done that, uh, had that same saying, like, oh, I love the book too much and that's the problem. <laughs> and we're just going to, I'm just going to highlight um, two sort of authors. So Holly Jane, she's um, Australian as well. Um, so she has, her series is called Bunny Girl. Um, and as you can see by uh, the panels down the end, they're really simple, um, few words, but very engaging Um and cute for, for that early developing reader. Um, so B, she loves helping her friends and she really wants to be a superhero, um, but none of the costumes she tries on are quite right. Um, so yes, and then she finds her personality, which is Bunny Girl. <laughs> um, and the first one came out in 2020 and the second one, uh, I believe came out this year. Um, and we did a creator chat, so uh, you can find that on our um, podcast page. Um, so, yeah, so that's Holly Jane. And the second spotlight for Junior is uh, Renee Tremel. Um, so her series, Ollie and B. there's four out now. She is an Australian uh, creator. Uh, she was American born, but she moved here in 2007. So we're claiming her. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so Ollie is an owl and B is a bunny. Um, and they're about to become best friends. Um, and they too are finding their inner superhero. Um, so as you can see, they are very fun. The panels aren't very complicated. They're simple words, um, but they're very engaging. Um, and they're very fun to read. So the yeah, junior graphic novels, sorry, younger reader graphic novels really have expanded a lot um, in the last few years. Uh, and just quick note, don't worry about writing all of these titles down. I will provide um, an A4 list of everything um, after the webinar um, that you'll have access to. 
And so now we move on to middle grade. Um, and in the interest of time, I've sort of put action, adventure and fantasy together. Um, but I could talk about these for the whole hour. So I've had to limit myself. <laughs> um, so yes, our first lot. Um, so the really the theme and trend with these ones is that most of them are a series. Um, they tackle sort of deeper themes um, like Lightfall, which is one of my, probably my favorite um, graphic novel this year. Um, the character, she is on a quest, um, but she was also dealing with her own sort of uh, internal struggles and um, is she good enough? But it really uh, deals with it in a really, really nice way that uh, is weaved into the story. Um, Wings of Fire is one that was adapted from a fiction novel and I don't think I can ever keep these on my shelf. <laughs> um, they come into the library and by the next day they are reserved and they're gone out again. Um, Cat Stranauts is super fun. It's a, I believe there's like eight in the series. Um, cats on the moon in space. You can't go wrong. <laughs> um, the Runaway Princess, I've popped in middle grade, but it is also good for that uh, younger reader as well. Um, she is a princess and she runs away <laughs> uh, because she wants to go to the, the new town. So there's a lot of um, uh, simple illustrations and not a lot of words in that one, but um, that's sort of a good bridge between for, for a younger reader and also a middle grade reader. And what I also noticed when I was putting this presentation together, a lot of these have a high percentage of female pr protagonists. Um, I did work at an all girls school, so that was um, sort of my focus. <laughs> um, but yes, I put that when I was putting all of these in, I was like, oh, a lot of female characters. Um, and there's generally more than one, one character. So there's a main character and a sidekick. Um, Barb the Brave is uh, a really fun series. Um, it's very funny. I'm waiting for the second one uh, to come into the library. Uh, the Five Worlds series, if you have uh, kids that love Amulet, uh, Five Worlds is definitely um, one to get as like a another read for them. Um, when I was at uh, the school, it honestly, the, the girls would just wait for it every year and they would finish it and then come and ask me when it was uh, the next one was being published. And whenever I said, oh, it's next year, they would get so mad at me. And I'm like, it's not my problem. <laughs> I'm trying. I'll get you other things, I promise. Um, so, yeah, that's a really fabulous series. And um, I really enjoyed Katie the Cat Sitter, um, which, yeah, I think that's the third one is coming out. Um, soon so then we go into our sort of spotlights so uh mike barry his series called action tank um is very fun uh so it's about a boy who finds himself on the other side of the solar system um and he must sort of rely on his brains and his courage um and a mysterious talking unicorn guy <laughs> if he wants to get home um so yes action tank is also sold in the u.s um he collabed with Nat Amor on the book we run tomorrow, and he also runs uh, workshops uh, for schools. Um, we also did a creator chat in 2020 um, with Mike, and I, I love I love this series. It's so fun. Uh, so I highly recommend this one. And our next one is uh, Treasure in the Lake by Jason uh, Piment. Um, which came out uh, late last year, I believe. Um, but yes, Grand Adventures, uh, they often begin where you least expect them. Um, so Iris is known because she read them all. Uh, however, then she's sort of found in a mystery of herself, um, landed in a mystery. Um, so yes, there's an unusually dark, dry river and that sort of leads them on their um, journey into this hidden town. And I just love um, the panels in this one, the story, it's, it's just really beautiful. Um, so yes, that is uh, Treasure in the Lake. <laughs> and then Middle Grade Friendship. Um, 
which has also really exploded. Uh, it all started with a smile. <laughs> um, when I first started uh, at the school that I was at in 2014, smile, we, we had to keep buying copies because it was so, um, uh, it was heavily reserved and borrowed. Uh, we couldn't keep up with the demand and it, it sort of became hard to try and find things for the girls to sort of continue on with. Um, and I'm so happy when I sort of go to the shelf now and there's so many that uh, really highlight just life, life stories, school stories, um, everyday problems. Um, so yes, there's Real Friends, uh, Making Friends, Kayla Miller's um, Click is now up to book for four with five coming out. Um, and then she has a spin-off series called uh, Besties. Um, so yes, I love all of these ones. And then um, Por Caso, again, uh, by Remy Lai. Um, that is a very, very cute one. Um, and then things like New Kid and Twins, um, Stargazing there. They're just so fun. Like, they make me happy. <laughs> um, and, and kids love them. Um, so one of uh, like a big thing uh, is adaptations um, that are coming out for the middle grade. So uh, classic books like Anne of Green Gables um, and the modern retelling of uh, Little Women. Um, but then, of course, we all know the Babysitter's Club. <laughs> I think that's up to book uh, 15 now. Um, and they have the Babysitter's Little Sister. Um, Sweet Valley Twins is now being adapted into a graphic novel. So that's the first one. And the second one is um, coming out shortly. And The Magic Tree House, which I got really excited when I found out that that was a graphic novel because I loved reading the books when I was <laughs> younger. <laughs> um, and the, also The Witches, they did a uh, graphic novel form. So they really are looking to turn um, fiction novels into graphic novels, which are fun. And then Big Apple Diaries by Alyssa Bermudez. She's also uh, originally American, but she lives down in Tasmania, so we're taking her again. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so her book, uh, it's the year 2000. She's 12, um, splitting time between um, her mum and her dad's uh new apartment and just sort of navigating through life as you know you're going into middle school there's new friends boys feelings emotions um so yeah it was really it was really lovely uh to read <laughs> um because you sort of remember some of those feelings uh when you were 12 <laughs> um but then it also deals with um 2001 um when 9-11 happened so there's a lot of a lot of big emotions happening in, in, in that book, but it's such a great uh, graphic novel. Um, and they were adapted by her, her diaries that she found. Um, and then she's turned it into Big Apple Diaries. And then um, I would love to hear from you. Uh, so if you have your phone next to you, um, if you scan the QR code, um, it will take you to a form. Um, and yeah, we want to know what, you know, what are some of your most borrowed graphic novels at your school um, or library? Um, and I will also pop these into the list as well. Because um, I think it's really good uh, for us to all share and, and to know, you know, what's popular at other schools, uh, what you can get in yours. Um, so I'll just leave that there for a moment. And then, yes, and then thank you. It was, it was quick. <laughs> I've shown you a lot of things. However, yeah, I will be making um, some A4 posters um, that have all the titles and it will be available on our blog. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much, um, Gabby. Uh, and yeah, we'll, we'll make sure that's available on our blog um, probably in the probably next week. Give us yes. a few minutes. 
<laughs> we're all volunteers here so yeah. <laughs> we have jobs and life and all that uh, but yeah excellent excellent selection of uh, of titles um i can't resist it because uh, um i can't resist myself so I, i'm just gonna show two others these are like for early readers and they're both australian and they're awesome they're really really good and i'm sure that we'll add them to to your list there uh, then for middle grade um from from Western Australia, Chicken Soros and Super Sidekicks, the whole trilogy here, and they're awesome. So much fun. My sons read these books again and again and again. Uh, and of course, next we have um, Campbell White and Elizabeth Marufo, who are coming to us from Western Australia. And this is my segue into this. <laughs> so I have this one as well. Uh, so this one, you know, kind of middle grade to young adult, perfect, read, amazing book. Now, um, Elizabeth and Campbell, they are the creative minds uh, behind Milktooth Arts Space, um, the School of Arts and Comics based in Perth. And they believe that all children are naturally creative and they see it as their job to nurture and inspire that creativity through painting, sculpting, textiles, comics, and illustration. And we kind of lifted uh, their ideas, uh, uh, you know, for the title for, for this webinar. Uh, so they run courses and things like that. They're also both artists and comic book creators. And, um, and, this one was actually nominated for an Eisner Award as well. So um, I'll just leave you in their, in their hands and they're gonna talk to us about um, how they nurture and inspire those kids and their love of comics. Off you go. Oh, hello, can you see us? Excellent. <laughs> Great. So um, thanks so much for having us. We're yeah, from Western Australia, we're calling, and uh, we're on the land of the Wadjuk Noongar people. So we'd just like to start by acknowledging them as the traditional custodians of the land. Um, today, yeah, we're going to be talking about how we nurture creativity and, and how we go about that. Um, so we find just in terms of encouraging reading, comics do that themselves. We were sort of yeah. talking about this Sorry. earlier. First of all, Campbell oh, is yeah. the director of the school, Milk Tooth School of Art and Story, That's right. which yeah. is a children's art school, but it also functions as a space for um, community to gather and incidental relationships to emerge. So we'll talk about that more in a minute. Yeah. And so... this, Campbell never talks about his book, so we've got Home Time. <laughs> It's massive and amazing, and home time too. <laughs> yeah, they're pretty it's big. And, and so yeah, these are these are fantasy stories set very much in Perth about a group of primary school age kids who, on the last day of school, fall into the Swan River and wash ashore in this mm -hmm. magic forest, and they got to get their way back home. So the first book took like ten years to make, and then the second one took about two years, and um. Yeah, it's like a whole bunch of autobio childhood stuff and, mm. and uh, you know, mm. a, a kind of reckoning with living in this place. And now I'm currently working on my next graphic novel called Lunar Express, which is for a slightly older group, um, age group. And it's like a big, it's like Sailor Moon set in Australia, basically, is the short elevator pitch. Um, and my name's Liz, and I am also the director of Milk to School. And both of us are co-directors of the Perth Comic Arts Festival yeah. as well, which has been able to grow and emerge out of the school that we started really yeah. and the gathering of people like-minded people together and I'm working on this at the moment Pup Pup is boss of the stars um, with a little cute uh, needle felted thing so, so that's a really quick thing of that's a Mexican retelling of, of Wind in the Wind Willows. Willows anyway we'll so. try to rush through that because yeah. um, you can always find that stuff about us later but Campbell's got some really great points to talk about we discussed how this works and we came mm. like with four four different sort of things to to, to think about yeah. or, or that we yeah. rely on or that we've identified in mm. terms of nurturing creativity and comics creativity for for people and you know this is how we've done it but there might be things that yourself if you're positioned within a school within a library mm. within a festival within an organization that maybe you'll be able to um you know take out and lift yeah. so um 
in terms of encouraging reading, we find comics just they're self encouraging. Um, you, I think the main if thing they is exist, if they exist, uh, they can do the work. Yeah. You know, there doesn't take much prompting for a kid to pick up a comic yeah. and just fall into it. That's right. Um, like you said about the Nancy. Yeah, there's a great quote about the Nancy Ernie Bushmiller's Nancy series that was like before a reader can decide whether to read it or not, they've already read it. And um, just, you know, you just absorb comics so quickly, which I think is beautiful. Mm. And um, so that's that half of it. <laughs> um, but what we want to talk about are these sort of four pillars, I guess, or these four components. And the first one is um, time space, having a time space for comics. Um, the second one is a structure. So providing a structure. And this is for the creation of comics that are inspired by um, somebody who's already fallen into that world, I guess. Mm. Yeah. Um, the third thing is then an outcome. So having outcomes. And then the fourth thing is like a, a connection. And, and we'll break those all down. So the first thing in terms of the time space is, you know, having time and space dedicated to comics. And so at Milktooth, we have a dedicated studio space um, where, and we have dedicated times where people can come and produce comics and be around comics where comics are the priority of that space. Um, and these are kids who come for regular classes. But then because of those amazing kids who come and we can create a business out of that, we're able to offer the space to um, older students who might be more reluctant to come to a kids' school, to adults um, who've just graduated from university looking to continue their connections they've made. Mm -hmm. We run comics. regular networking events there. Yeah. Um, we run Perth Comic Arts Festival meetings there. We have other sort of meetups. So the architecture. The architecture. Now, mm. if you're at a school, you likely already have a place. If you work at a library, you have a place. You know, the place is is vital but or the space but the second component is time so you've got to kind of marry them up and dedicating a time to prioritizing comics and what i think is really vital here is not just um, time for the appreciation of comics which is important but prioritizing the creation of comics um, because when you focus onto the onto the creation of comics the appreciation naturally is already there but what you do is you you're encouraging people to shift their, their mindset from being a consumer or being a passive reader to being, you know, like a storyteller themselves. <laughs> um, and if you don't make that distinction, what you potentially get is just, what you get is a bunch of people, you know, it's a book club, which is lovely and wonderful. But if we're trying to encourage creativity, a response from the reader, you need to provide, like, you need to make that clear. Because what we've seen really clearly with We've been um, working in this way for seven years with a physical space that has grown slowly. And we've had a, um, you know, opportunities to experiment, to test things, to see what works, what doesn't. And now it's really finely honed. Um, but also what happens are all those mental health benefits of people coming together who are like-minded and can talk about um, everyday things, incidental things while they're creating and making. And because a comic can be anything, um, the, 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 you know, entering into it is the barrier to entry is really low. Mm. You need pencils and papers. You really yep. don't need much, but I'm um, sorry, carry on with your thing. Yeah. Well, I think that's sort of the space time and the way, you know, if you, like I said, if you've already got the space, it's about the time. And if you don't have a space, you can usually, you know, wrangle something, talk to a, a library or mm. to, to book a room and then, and then it's the time. So the second component is the structure. And you need to provide people with a structure for making comics. Um, I have every term I run three different courses at Milktooth. Uh, one of them is called Comics Mentoring. Uh, one of them is called Comics Quest, and one of them is called Manga Club. And with the three of those, you know, we always do. It's an eight-week course, or it's a two-day intensive that we run. And it's always like a foundation of, um, you know, like comics literacy that we build upon, that, that we set up, that we, get, um, you know, just reinforce the grammar and, and the, the rules of comics literature. Um, in the same way, you know, I think often, often you have this thing with native language speakers where they don't actually know what, what grammatical terms there are yeah. and they don't, don't actually know what the rules of their own language are. So I think if kids are growing up reading comics, they might not actually, they, they intuit them but they don't actually know how to articulate them. So we give them that language. And then from there, we provide a structure. So some of the structure is 
very simple things like I provide page templates, like a dozen different templates that are already panelled up. Um, you know, so that's really straightforward. I provide like five different drawing materials that are set. It's really straightforward. I provide um, a book length that they're going to work on, which is set, which is really straightforward because I've often heard comics making as described as kind of like juggling chainsaws while riding a like a unicycle. And there are so many different skills that go into making a comic that um, for a first time maker, it's incredibly overwhelming. Yeah, um, yeah. Paneling, page layouts, compositions within the panels, figure drawing, costuming, like casting and I characters, think, um, camera angles. Campbell is a person who he can actually draw with his eyes closed. So he's one of those people who doesn't know what he knows. And I am, I don't know anything about comics. I do a little bit now from watching Campbell and I'm trying to make my own, but I'm able to tell him what it is that he mm. knows so that he can then like f filter it out into manageable mm. chunks. And I know? guess over seven years of watching students, yeah. you know, every time someone struggles, I make a note and I'm like, okay, that's a roadblock, let's clear it away. <laughs> so I try to clear away as many roadblocks and leave the students with a few choices that they have to make with each panel. And that- So I just want to make a point the there flow. where what would be really essential and helpful to helping um, people have more creativity with comics is to support the journey of comics makers in their teaching of what they know. So if there's ways that libraries and schools can be open to comics makers, comics artists in residence at their school, figuring this out themselves and going on that teaching journey um, rather than like librarians or teachers thinking they have to be the expert on this yet another thing. Yeah, there are experts mm. out there, but how can we help them test and trial and experiment to be really good teachers and share what they what they and know? Develop what resources I've, and I've structure. seen happen and it's amazing. Yeah. Mm. And so then with that, you know, with that structure, what I kind of do is I shift up the theme or the focus from term to term. So this term in Comics Quest we're doing, we're adapting ancient Greek myths. And in Manga Club, we're looking at Tetsuka's Astro Boy. Um, and so every term, there's a different theme that the student, but the, the cup, the vessel is the same that the students are pouring their creativity into. So there's that stability. Um, so, and then comics mentoring, they're, they're making their own comics, but still within a framework. Um, and so I think that's that's How many comics thing. get made each term at Milton? Each term we make, uh, it's like about 25 comics every term. So like different different works. Yeah. And then, you know, that over four terms, you know, yeah. so it's it's a little <laughs> over 100 different stories that we get made every, every year. Um, so we've got this massive archive of works. So I guess that comes to the next thing, which is about outcomes. And we're really, really outcome focused. Um, not at the expense of creativity, but part of the journey of a storyteller is getting the story out. You know, so many aspiring creators have, you know, a, a shelf full of ideas that they've been working mm -hmm. on for decades that never actually see the light of day. So or going waiting through, for perfection, you know, waiting for it to be just right or to know everything. I need to know everything. No. And it's like, no, nope, eight weeks, just get something out there. And it's so, um, yeah, it's yeah. just empowering and you need to learn that cycle you learn so much more by completing that cycle even if it's imperfect yeah than by like inching towards it and never quite getting mm. there so outcomes are important um liz was holding up before these are like the term long outcomes so it's it's short books um they're little they're a5 size they're black and white um and you know, we get them telling a story that has a beginning, a middle and end, and not, no to be continued. Um, and then at the end, they all get, you know, like 10 copies and they swap them with other students in the class. They put one in our library at Milk Tooth and they take them home to share with friends and family. So and they also sell them at the Perth Comic Arts Festival. That's, yeah, yeah. that's that final step. And yeah. they work, they go off. People cannot get enough of these comics, yeah. but made by kids, they're like, three dollars and the kids get this money and it's amazing it's lovely so that's that's a regular outcome that we do then um some of our students are getting to like you know mid-teens because we've been running for so long so we set up a project where they had a slightly nicer outcome which is iso id which we put together for the perth comic arts festival which is a5 size perfect bound full color um and they were able to just like spend far more time on this and have a really pretty kind of outcome that felt really special for them so that's and we were another able, great we were able to offer that as um a more accessible 
a way to engage with Campbell's teaching and other professional comics makers teaching here. Um, so it was free for the participants to attend and we had funding to pay the who funded it, Propel and uh, Healthway. Healthway. So it wasn't too much money that we needed, but because we'd learned exactly how to run these things, mm -hmm. we were able to deliver it and have an outcome at the end. And again, the kids got X amount of comics that they were able to sell at tables at Pika mm -hmm. and make make their own money. And then another kind of outcome that we do are these tail town newspapers. So this is like a standard community newspaper uh, format, but it's it's just all the good stuff. It's just comics. So um, back to back comics every page. So we've run this project a few times now. Um, the first time was just at a local library with community members telling stories about their their community, mm -hmm. their neighborhood. And that was the comic artist in residence um, opportunity where um, we were paid as artists and we ran five community workshops where we we had engaging drawing activities as well as um, crafting. We we'll, we'll mm. need to hurry it up a little bit. I yeah, think. sorry. Um, <laughs> um, so, and we've run that twice as part of the Perth Comic Arts Festival as well. So, um, so that's another fantastic like outcome. Outcomes are really vital. And then the outcomes then connect to the fourth pillar which is about connections. And like Liz has sort of alluded to, um, we set up the Perth Comic Arts Festival because we realised that we were training up all these students, all these kids in how to make <laughs> comics, and then there was nowhere for them to go. So we set up the Perth Comic Arts Festival um, with a bunch of other really fantastic committee members. Yeah. And this was then um, enabled our students to have a space to then showcase their work. So they worked towards that. And that's the that's closes the circle because then the work is out there, the stories are sh being shared and connecting with people. And then those people are in turn being inspired to come back to that, you know, the time space at the beginning. So if you can kind of figure out a way to close that. So I don't mean you need to start your own festival. You can tap into existing mm -hmm. ones or have a market day, mm -hmm. but, but closing that circle. And what is I also like think so about important. is um, like the ordinariness of, you know, this is a, it's a free community newspaper. It's handed out for free. There's 2000 out in the world. And it just means that this is an art form that is truly um, inclusive, diverse and accessible, I mm. think. And so keeping that at the heart of what we do means that it just, it's just like that ordinary art in your life that is the most powerful we feel. Mm. And I think that covers everything. <laughs> I think we've, we've ran, ran on ahead. Um, we've got a bunch of videos that you can watch that we're wanting mm -hmm. to share, but um, if we can throw up some links after we finish chatting, if you're keen to look at them of, of the workshops, of the festival, of the outcomes. And um, yeah, hopefully you, you're able to go and inspire and um, some creative yeah. uh, outcomes yourself and create some spaces for comics. That was uh, that was excellent. Uh, I I really admire you guys for for the work you do. You know, uh, it's really really special. And um, I have to also say, by the way, Sailor Moon in Australia just sounds like a complete winner. Uh, so, <laughs> can't wait to read that um, uh, but yeah the Perth Comic Arts Festival is a beautiful beautiful event I was there this year and I, I flew to Perth for the first time in my life just for that event and it was amazing <laughs> and and it was great to see your students selling their comics there it was just amazing and and the moment I saw that, I knew, okay, got, uh, I need to talk to you guys and I need to have you in this webinar. And some food for thought for libraries, you know, uh, maybe there's a local creator that you can engage, you know, yeah. and 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 uh, create a comic club at the library. Uh, I mean, you know, Dave Pilkey sells books by the millions and, you know, his latest series is Cut Kid Comic Club. So some food for thought there for libraries. Yeah. Thank you so much, guys. All right. Thank you. Now moving on, our next speaker is coming from the US and I'm really excited to have Julian with us. She's the school librarian at um, six to 12th grade public uh, school in New York City. She's the Japanese culture and manga librarian for the New York City Department of Education as well as the founder of the Manga in Libraries website and webinar series. 
Uh, she's received tons of awards and recognition for her work in this field. And she has presented on manga at New York Comic Con, San Diego Comic Con, the American Library Association's annual conference, the International Association School Librarianship. And today she's with us. And you can find a ton of resources on her website, mangainlibraries.com. And she also has a book coming up next year, which I'm really dying to read. So, um, Gillian, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I'm excited to virtually be in Australia. Uh, maybe one day I'll be on the land of Australia. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I could talk about manga for hours, for days, for a really long time. But I, I narrowed it down just thinking about the idea of inspiring and nurturing reading. So I was trying to just focus on how manga in itself sparks joy for our readers. And we know we need to have it on our shelves, but sometimes as librarians and educators, we can't really uh, find the words to articulate the value, right? We know kids love it. That's why we have it. But I did interview some students about how they felt about manga, and that's what I'm going to share with you. So let me get my slides out. Okay. This is just, all right. So I'll just, I'll just read this, even though I kind of already said this. Uh, librarians are eager to fill their bookshelves with manga because the demand from readers is so high. But why does manga spark so much joy for our readers? During this session, I will discuss why manga is essential to fostering a lifelong love of reading. So first, I want to make sure we have a universal understanding of what joy is. Uh, if you've seen the movie Inside Out from Disney Pixar, it's each of these characters represent our core emotions. And this is joy. And I equate this to students who grab manga off the shelves and they could take it home. And this is just like their arms full of, and their faces all lit up. So I would define joy as an emotional response to something, anything that brings you pleasure, makes you happy, brightens your day, gets you excited, satisfies you and fulfills you. And I believe that manga does this for readers. So just some general information about uh, reading manga and how it can help readers. And this is pretty applicable to comics and graphic novels as well. So manga can help readers connect with characters, explore identity, maybe their own identity, develop empathy and compassion, and improve emotional intelligence. A lot of social emotional skills uh, can be developed through reading manga. Manga also helps to reduce stress and anxiety and helps readers to escape the pressures of life. I know when I read, I just relax. I feel like my shoulders drop, my blood pressure drops, and I just get lost in the story. And I know that happens for our young readers as well. It also allows readers to understand multiple perspectives, develop social emotional well being and connecting to uh, what we just learned about milk tooth, build imagination, build creativity, and of course, help with reading, writing, and language skills. So last year, at the end of the school year, I had a bunch of seventh graders who at that point were about 12 years old. They had come to the library during their English class to just check out some books. And I asked the English teacher if I can just meet with a couple of students that I knew were avid manga readers just to have a casual conversation about how they felt when reading manga and after they read manga. Because I've never actually really, I talk to kids about manga all the time, like the story that they're reading, the characters, the action, the plot, but I never really talked about manga, how it made them feel. So this was my first chance actually sitting down with kids and they really surprised me. And they surprised me because they were able to so clearly articulate their feelings about manga. And I feel like we don't give them enough credit to be able to just self-express. So the three questions that I gave or I asked them were, how do you feel when you read manga? What do you like most about reading manga? And what do you learn when you read manga? So just to be clear, this wasn't like real research or real focus groups. This was just a casual conversation. So here's some of the quotes that I had got uh, from kids as I, voraciously like wrote, wrote down things as they were talking to me because they were so excited. Um, so how do you feel when you read manga? 
When I read manga, it makes me feel an emotional range of wow and damn. It gets me energized and I want to read more. I specifically remember this quote because when the student said it to me, he like got down and started doing push-ups. Like he was like so pumped. Like manga gets him so pumped. He just started like, <laughs> I was like, okay, okay, Christian. <laughs> but it just goes to show how excited they are just to even be able to talk about manga. So it gets you hooked and you want to keep reading. Manga makes me feel better than regular books. You'll see a theme of this regular books throughout this conversation I've had with kids. And obviously somebody is telling them that manga is other, right? That manga isn't regular reading, that manga is different, but different, almost like different negative. And we need to change that up, right? Manga is a book and their reading experiences are completely valid. So manga, uh, it's fun intrigued, what's going to happen, excited, I want to go home and read and do nothing else. I get emotionally invested. When I read, I get lost in my own world. Relax and chill. Stay up late to read. I get into a zone and the world around me disappears. Happy and calm. Good experience. Takes away distractions. I don't have to read for school. I do it for myself. I can read manga every day. And I think just listening to the students at this point, made me realize their pure joy around reading manga and how they are just so intrinsically motivated to read manga and it brings them complete satisfaction. So as librarians, I think, how could we possibly ask for anything more? <laughs> uh, the next question I asked was, what do you like most about reading manga? So this is like the process of reading. Sometimes I just find myself staring at the art. Good storylines motivate me to read. I become the character. I am the character. Manga lasts a long time so you can invest. The art is realistic and visually stunning. And I thought it was really great that the students were bringing up the art because obviously manga is a visual medium and the art tells a whole story aside from the text. I'm always thinking about it because it engages me. Regular books, there it is again, are boring. <laughs> I picture the manga moving and I add color. That's the imagination, that creativity. Engaged in what is happening. I feel like I have a relationship with the characters. I can relate. I feel an emotional bond. I like to read about their backstory and their family. I can't wait to see what happens next. I like to try new things, new series, and new genres. Now, if we're thinking about building stronger readers and lifelong readers, strong readers read different genres. We know that manga has really something for everybody. But if a reader is just reading the same kind of story, like just fantasy with the same themes, the same tropes, the same ideas over and over again, they're not really building their reading skills outside of that genre. But if students are willing to read action series, fantasy series, magical girl series, right, horror and thriller, they're building different skills because they're seeing different stories, different themes, different uh, everything, really. So that's making them stronger readers. Manga is such a mix of emotions, new opportunities to think about life. I'm interested in watching the characters grow up. I can use my imagination and picture myself being there. There's something to read for everyone's enjoyment. And this is the last question. I really wanted to see what students were taking away after they put that manga down. So the question was, what do you learn when reading manga? I learned... These things are going to surprise you. They surprise me. I learned about, and they're also 12. I, I'm sorry, I keep interrupting myself, but I feel like some of these things I didn't learn until I was a grown adult. <laughs> so what did you learn when reading manga? I learned about friends. What a friend is doing wrong, see red flags. The way you respond to things emotionally matters. I learned about trust. Be careful who you trust. Never back down. Push yourself to your limits. Determination. I learned how to act, how to be social, and how to have relationships. All the things that we are trying to teach middle schoolers, right? They're learning through manga. Okay. I learned Japanese. I learned about other places, what they eat. And this student just went on and on and on about the cultural literacy. People can change different perspectives, understand others. Character development is life changing. Accomplish something new. I learn about trust and honesty. Cherish the moments you have. 
Life lessons in manga can help you in your own life. See the perspective of your friends so you can help. So not only are they becoming self-aware, but they're building skills that allow them to become better members of their community, better friends, have stronger interpersonal relationships by not only reflecting on their own emotions, but on the emotions of the person near them, which is fantastic. And they're only 12. So hopefully they're actually like fulfilling this in their lives. <laughs> but I think this whole conversation I had with kids just blew my mind and it made me want to actually have more conversations with kids about manga and actually push to have manga being taught in the classroom. So I do teach a class, a Japanese visual storytelling to 12th graders who are 18. And hopefully I can somehow get younger readers involved in that. But right now it's just 12th graders. So everything we want students to learn about lifelong love of reading, uh, social emotional development can actually happen with manga as a catalyst. So not just having students read manga, but actually engaging students in conversations about their reading experiences. So some things that we can consider besides building a collection in our library is if you can't teach a course, is thinking about the programming that you're offering. So making sure that you have a manga section, you're offering comfortable seating for a lot of students who just consume that manga right in the spot. Uh, any kind of uh, area where students can hang up their artwork. So I do have Artist Alley in my library. It's now two walls. It's just growing and spreading of just student artwork that I've collected over the years. And I think they love reflecting on artwork that they made when they're younger. Like I had a 12th grader last year who found something she made in seventh grade and was just like, oh my gosh, my art style has changed so much. But I think she was really happy that her work was going to like stay on the wall past her graduation. So I'm just going to give you a couple of resources because uh, I don't know how much time I have left. I might have went over or under. I don't know. But uh, the Manga and Libraries webinar series, if you're looking to learn more specific things about manga, because clearly uh, 15 minutes isn't enough time, you can go to the manganlibraries.com website. Uh, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. And we have 12 webinars so far. Each webinar is an hour long. There's experts from all over the world participating in specific conversations connected to these 12 topics. And each webinar comes with a resource list. So if the topic is disability, visibility, and manga, you might find some articles you should read, a podcast you should listen to, or just anything connected to learning more about that topic. Also, each webinar comes with a book list. So if you look on, that's a screenshot from the website. You can see it says webinars in pink and right next to it says lists. There are 12 lists, one connected to each webinar, but I also have three other lists, which I update pretty much daily as I'm reading new manga that I think is best for readers. So there's an all ages manga list. So manga that's recommended for elementary school. And then there's a manga for teens list and a manga for older teens. So those aren't just like any manga, those are manga that I would personally uh, recommend you buy for your collection. And the lists are pretty lengthy now. There's maybe like 30 to 40 titles on each list and they're updated often. So last year, I also wrote an article that was published in Synergy, which is the School Library Association of Victoria and Australia, their, their journal. And this article is now available for free. You don't need a code, you don't need anything. So that's the link there. It's bit.ly forward slash synergy article. And this article covers things that you probably maybe want to know about, a little more manga 101 kind of stuff. I cover what is manga, manga literacy, manga programming, manga collection development, and manga challenges. So thinking about how to avoid a challenge or what to do if you do have a challenge to manga in your collection. And that's that was just written, I think, in June. So it's still pretty updated. And then the last thing I want to share, cover reveal. You are actually the first people to see the cover of this book. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it. I mean, I've seen it before, but I haven't actually posted it anywhere. It's not even on my website, but I couldn't resist the, um, the, the temptation to share it with you here. So that is the cover of my book, my favorite colors. And it comes out in April. There are eight chapters in this book. Uh, why Manga, Manga 101, Manga Collection Development, Representation in Manga, where I interview some experts across the country, 
social emotional learning in manga, manga programming, teaching with manga, where I talk a little bit about that course, and Manga Sparks Joy, which is where this presentation was kind of inspired from. It is available for pre-order, no pressure, but the link is there. It's bit.ly forward slash MIL book. And that comes out in April. And I think that's all I have to say. Yeah, so with everything that's going on in the world, give readers what they want, what they need, and what brings them joy. Read manga. And if you want to get in touch with me, uh, the contact information is on my website, or you could just email me at mangaandlibraries at gmail.com, and I will answer all of your questions. So I'll stop sharing. Thank you so much. I hope I didn't go over. No, no, that was perfect. That was amazing. Uh, um, okay. Yeah. No, that, that, was, that was really, really good. And the, the, some people were asking questions about um, junior and all ages um, manga. And obviously, you know, I recommend that you check uh, the list that she mentioned. Um, yeah, they, I check them regularly myself. And, um, and personally, I also want to say Campbell also shared some um, junior mangas that were great right there. Uh, but I, I'm also going to recommend this one, Fox and Little Tanuki. Yes, 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 yes. Beautiful. My son absolutely adores this series and he's read these volumes quite a few times. Um, and one, one of my favorite animes when I was a kid uh, has just been um, released in manga form as well. So Dragon Quest, highly um, recommend that as well. Yeah. Um, so yeah, um, we're very close to the hour. And uh, so, you know, I understand if some people have to have to go, uh, but where I always like to have some time for questions and answers. So if if you don't have anywhere to, to run to and you've got time, please stay and uh, we'll try to answer some of the questions and have a bit more of a conversation here. So Marisa, are there some questions that, um, that were in the chat and that, uh, you know, we could answer or they could answer? Well, we have had uh, some definite interest in when the Milk Tooth Creators books are coming out. <laughs> so that might be a case uh, of we may need to do a creator chat with both of you on your books as they get closer to release. Yeah, so, oh, can you hear me? Yep. Maybe. All good. Yep. Um, my the book I'm working on, Lunar Express, is going to probably come out. What is it? Twenty three, twenty five, in twenty twenty five is when I'm aiming to have that one out. Oh really? Yeah. You'll finish it next year. Oh wait, what year are we in? Twenty two. Yeah. <laughs> no, twenty four. Twenty twenty four. Sorry, a year early. Um, mm. Yeah. So so that'll that'll come up then. And that's good to go. You have a publisher. Yeah. So that'll be out through Top Shelf, yeah. who published Home Time as well. And then I've got my next book after that is also in the works, but hasn't been mm. revealed yet. Mm. Um, and then your book, Pup Pup is the Boss of the Stars. Yeah, I'm just having so much fun making it that um, hopefully there'll be somebody interested in in, in publishing it. Um, so I say it'd be finished in the next couple of years. It is quite labour intensive because I'm sculpting everything and taking photos and then digitally altering everything. Yeah, it's like a needle filtered comic. But I'm so pretty it's... obsessed. So it could be finished in the next year and a half or yeah. something, I guess. Nice. Yeah. And, and... Can, Elizabeth, can you show us actually really quickly some of the characters that you're designing for the comics? Um, yes. So... Right there. Um, the main characters, uh, um, this is really interesting for anyone listening. Um, she's actually creating all the characters uh, herself, and and then she uh, takes photos and then manipulates them to make the comic. This these are the um, main characters. Yeah. So this is based on the dog from my childhood in Mexico, who had a little love heart shaped patch. She was like a street dog that my parents um, had. And this main character, which is loosely based on me, she's a painter, a struggling painter. She's angry at the world and she decides <laughs> to leave her town and 
um, the and here's the the sort of cover. So you can see a little bit how digitally I then work on top of things. Mm. Um, so there's some sort of panels. And it's a huge learning curve for me. But what I've done is I've taken everything that I do anyway in my art practices, painting, sculpting with textiles, making tiny things out of clay, and started learning digital skills and putting them all in one thing um, because I did have a more traditional sort of artist background of exhibiting in galleries and things, but it's quite an impotent way to work, I feel, compared to looking at how comics makers like Campbell and other people here in Perth have been able to just have their art be out in the world in a book form and continue to speak for them, I think is a really powerful thing about creating mm. and having books in the world. And like everyone here can appreciate how powerful that is. It was really wonderful um, to hear the, the Mangarin libraries very well articulate what we couldn't, you know, mm. which is like, what is it that, that people love about reading? We know what it is that we don't know how to articulate it. So that was yeah. wonderful to hear. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so um, I'm going to answer quickly with uh, one of the questions that I've seen there. So Andy James, um, yes, we do have some resources on our website. Please check our website. It's aliagraphic.blogspot.com. And uh, we have some resources there uh, so that you can um, you know, read about, and then you can talk to parents and sometimes teachers as well, you know, who may be telling you, you know, it's just a comic, I want them to read a real book. Well, there's a lot of uh, uh, research that you can read about and we do have resources on our website. So just check it there. Um, was there anything else, Marisa? There was a question asking if the Milk Tooth sessions are ever available online, possibly so those of us that are not in the Perth area Mm. And also, get a chance to join. And also whether you run also external workshops in public libraries. Yeah, so we we started out being kind of artists who would go to places mm. and um, and run things in, in libraries and schools. And we have done that in the past and we still really believe that a really powerful thing for artists to do. But the demand became so strong and the... Um, the kind of the results of having an ongoing relationship and helping kids for longer than a one-time visit were just so uh, remarkable that that just continued to be where mm. we we directed our focus. Um, what we hope to do in you know our five-year sort of plan is to get to a place where we can. How do we make our courses more accessible? That really is something that we we struggle with, you mm. know. Um, so part of PCAF and the Comic Maker Network is starting to like get those um, networks happening so that, you know, just as a model of how to, like us maybe being a model of how to share your, your art making and like actually make a living as an artist that you feel um, good about that, that you can then keep sharing your mm -hmm. skills. But at the moment we don't offer any online stuff. We hope to. But I think, yeah, just being um, able to, to 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 show people that you can, yeah, you can do this, and mm -hmm. and you are desirable as an art maker. We want, I don't know, artists tend to feel really bad about themselves, and the world tells them that they're not valued, and um, there is a lot of value. So, and I think um, just going back to, you know, teachers. There's a question there about teachers and parents as well, not feeling like comics are a valid medium. And I think that what's amazing is we, we see some parents like that sometimes who will, they'll look at us bewildered and say, what do I do with this child who wants to do this thing, you know, help, you know? So yeah, I think just the ordinariness of having comics makers around the place is going to help mm. with all of those things, you know? Yeah, the visibility of it all. but. So no to online classes yet, mm. and we very rarely do external workshops. Mm. It's um, but if you get in contact with us, we might be able to either do it or find someone, another comics maker who yeah, can. Yeah, so part we of know lots of 
part of the Perth Comic Arts Festival is to, it's all volunteer, it's not for profit, and we're trying to form a kind of like database of artists who have their skill sets. So if librarians and teachers are looking for comic artists who are, because it's one thing to do it, it's another thing to want to share it with kids or feel confident sharing it with teachers and librarians. So I think the Comic Festival helps with that confidence. Parents, teachers, the public seeing this festival, normalising what comics are and then seeing that, you know, these people who are quite, you know, inward looking and like to just work by themselves um, are able to, to be in places and spaces. Yeah, uh, and, uh, oh. I want to say uh, a lot of people question, uh, you know, that, that there are parents and teachers who question these things as well. Um, but uh, for anyone who is feeling, you know, this kind of um, need to explain to parents or teachers, uh, your know, why comics, we do have those resources on our website. You can email me anytime. I have a background in teaching and in media studies and mm -hmm. comics and literacy are, you know, what Gillian said before that she can talk manga all day. Uh, I can talk comics and literacy all day. Uh, yeah, so um, feel free to reach out, okay? And our email is aliagraphicinfo at gmail.com. Feel free to reach out, all right? But also check our website because there are resources there. I, I actually just wanted to, well, now the trains are passing. Sorry, I can't hear when they're passing. Do you hear them? No, I no. live next to nope. No, I I live next to four lanes of trains, and when they pass, I'm like I can't even hear my own voice. Uh, I wanted to say something that connects to something Elizabeth was just mentioning, but now I forgot what it was. But I'll say what it is, and maybe you'll remember the connection. But I have uh, in my school there was an eighth grade student who reads a lot of manga, so obviously he's drawing a lot of manga in class. So his English teacher had come to me. I guess she just connected me with that for some reason. I wonder why. And she's like, so this student is, instead of taking notes or paying attention in class, they just keep drawing. And there's nothing that I could do to get them to stop drawing as if it's a bad thing that he's like this beautifully talented artist. So I said, why don't you have a conversation with him where you, why don't you just like staple together a couple of pieces of paper and give him a sketchbook, right? Give him the sketchbook and ask him to draw out the things that he's learning in class or just like, whatever he's doing graffiti or anime characters and connect it to actually the things that he's learning. So he's paying attention to you because he probably is paying attention while he's drawing, which some teachers don't realize. I said, but maybe he can start incorporating some of the things in class. So he, she's like, Oh, this sounds great. She brought it to the student and the student was like, really, I can really do this. You're my favorite teacher. Just like so excited about this opportunity. And it's like, that was like, a little random thing that allows this artist to continue to grow, but also show that he has connection to the content. So I think just finding ways not to shut them down, but to embrace and mm -hmm. connect it to the learning. So and, I don't know how, how it's been going, but. And also like in terms of for English teachers, if they've got some kind of required reading for the course that they're all going through together, things like um, The Giver have graphic novel or manga adaptations now, and being able to bring both versions together helps connect it to more of the students. Mm -hmm. Or if there isn't a graphic novel adaptation yet, <laughs> I would have my students, when I was teaching English in Japan, I would have the students do little like, you know, a four panel or more mm -hmm. version of one of the events from mm -hmm. the part they've just been reading. Yeah. So instead of, you know, standard book reports, maybe as their reading feedback journal, they can mm -hmm. take what's in paragraph forms and then turn it into something that's a bit more visual. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah and let's not forget that you know making comics and reading comics you're using multiple literacies so oh, it's incredible yeah so, it's a really it's a really really complex way of thinking and um ordering many information and many many things all at one time so it is very upsetting that this it still exists where it's seen as a lesser than you know um 
and just thinking about what you were saying, Marissa, about the adaptations, I tried so hard to read Shakespeare. In my 20s, I tried, I just kept trying and I just couldn't. And I'm like, oh, what's wrong with me? And then I read um, Nikki Greenberg's Hamlet and it's like, oh, it's supposed to be a comic, you know? Of course it's supposed to be read in a comic. Like, and it's, it's um, yeah, it just, you know, it leaves many people out if you just think about reading being um, just with words. Yeah, it really does. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, actually, in terms of adaptations and things like that, and where you mentioned Shakespeare, uh, the manga classics uh, mm -hmm. series is excellent. And they adapt a lot of the classic books, including Shakespeare, into manga, uh, manga mm -hmm. graphic novels. And they're yeah. very, very faithful adaptations. They do their mm -hmm. best to really make a faithful adaptation um, mm -hmm. uh, of the original book in manga form. And I've read a few of them and they're awesome. So mm -hmm. I highly recommend those as well if you don't have them at your library. Yeah. I, I also think just regarding, um, sorry, regarding manga, I noticed in my library, I don't remember if it was this school year or last school year that a girl was reading it the wrong way. She was reading it left to right, rather than how it's supposed to be in the Japanese style, right to left. And I think a lot of kids want to read manga and maybe just need a little a little support from their librarian or their teacher to make sure that one, they are reading it right to left in the Japanese style, that they're able to follow because obviously the story will only make sense that way. But also yeah. some of the Japanese visual language, some of the elements, all the emotions the characters are expressing, a lot of the onomatopoeias that Right, and could still be in Japanese, just make, making sure that they are reading manga correctly so that they can have a better experience. And yeah. I think some of the English teachers and so forth don't realize that it's something that does need to be taught how to read a comic book or a graphic novel or a manga. Mm -hmm. It's they they might think it's easier because so much of it's visual and it's not in paragraphs but just learning how to connect the visuals versus the words and kind of comparing because some things may not show up in the text they may only show up in the visuals and yeah. you know if you don't have someone that's taught you how to process these things that may be a barrier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. what I was saying before. There's actually a lot to decode. There are a lot of different yeah. elements, visual and text and things that you need to put together to in order to make meaning. And and um, that's why I always say that, uh, you know, we very often hear that uh, comics are great for reluctant readers. And they are. It's, it's true that they engage them. Uh, but I think that uh, um, I always say that that's kind of half the story because they're also great for advanced readers because mm -hmm. of the things I was saying. Mm -hmm. yeah. so you're using yeah. multi-hypothesis and you're putting together a lot of elements and there are lots of different layers of meaning making. Yeah, so, we had, um, we in uh, our school, we had a, um, a gifted class for the year five and six and for one of their guided reading books that uh, for a term the teacher came to us um and asked for a graphic novel um to use and i think we uh, we used white bird um the wonder um novel um and yeah the the girls they loved it and they you know, we would ask them when they would come um, for their library lessons, like, oh, are you enjoying like doing white bird for, and they all were like, it's wonderful. <laughs> it mm -hmm. was just something different to connect back to their units and all of them took something different out of it. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it was, it was a great, great unit. <laughs> and it's also good for learning another language. I yeah. mean, me, when I lived in Japan, I learned a lot more Japanese through manga and through anime because it had that additional context to it Yeah. versus just having it be in a textbook. It's, yeah. 
you know, it's a lot more understandable when it's got that extra stuff going on through the art. Yeah, you can infer the meaning sometimes if you don't understand the words, you can mm -hmm. infer the meaning of, of what's going on. Excellent. Are there any other questions from uh, anyone? Um, please feel free to ask questions. Um, you know, we're just having a lovely chat, but <laughs> yeah. Um, Marisa, where, was there any other question that um, that you saw in the chat? Uh, that covers the questions that have come up in chat. Perfect. All right. So uh, we may just leave it there. Uh, so thank you, everyone. Um, you know, and thank you to all the guests, and thank you for everyone uh, joining us today. If um, you know, if you have any questions or you know, um, there's anything that um, we've done right or anything that we've done wrong, and you think we can do better, or any topics on webinars that you want to suggest to us, please email aliagraphicinfo at gmail.com and you know follow our twitter and facebook although twitter is an, an absolute mess at the moment uh but uh you know uh yeah we're, we're still there we'll see what the future holds mm -hmm. uh, so thank you everyone for joining us thank you, I'll stop thank you. thanks